Hello and welcome back to a new lecture on syntax. All right, so let's quickly summarize. When it comes to anaphores, we said that an anaphore, like himself, must be bound. We said that this sentence, the first sentence, was grammatical. And that's because we have coindexation, and John C. commands himself, and therefore the anaphore himself is bound. And so the sentence is grammatical. Now when John said that Mary danced with himself, again, the principal A states that himself is an anaphore and should be bound. But it's not bound here because, I'm sorry, it is bound here because it is co-indexed and John C. commands himself, but we still find out that this sentence is ungrammatical. Let's try to find out why. What is the difference between sentence A and sentence B? Well, in sentence A, himself and its antecedent are in the same clause. But in sentence B, himself and its antecedent are in different clauses. How do we know? We have a complementizer here, that. If you recall, the complementizer is an indication that we have a CP, which is another embedded clause. Therefore, this is an embedded clause. The main clause is the bigger one. So himself and the antecedent John are in different clauses. The antecedent is in the main clause, while the anaphore himself is in the embedded clause. So then let's try to modify principle A a bit. Maybe it is the case that an anaphore must be 1. Bound and 2. In its binding domain. And the binding domain here would be the same clause. Let's see if this new definition helps us. So in the first one, now recall we want this to be bound but we want it to be bound in the same clause. Himself and its antecedent John are in the same clause. Now we ask, is himself bound by John? Yes, therefore everything is good. How about in the second sentence? Here's himself and here's John. First question we ask, are they in the same clause? No. Therefore we don't even need to go to the second one. We already know that principle A has been violated meaning that we did not go by principle A. That's why the sentence is ungrammatical. Therefore, we can refine our principle A to state that an anaphore must be bound in its binding domain. And we know that the binding domain of an anaphore is the same clause as its antecedent. Great, now let's see what was wrong with principle B. Now in the first one, we know that principle B states that a pronoun must be free. That's why this one is ungrammatical. Mary hit her. Notice that they are both co-indexed, okay, they are co-indexed. And at the same time, Mary C commands her, therefore her is bound. But we want it to be free. So that's the first violation of principle B. That's why the sentence is ungrammatical. How about in the second one? In the second one, they are also co-indexed, and Mary also C commands the pronoun, but it's grammatical. So notice, the pronoun is bound, it violates our initial principle B, but the sentence is still grammatical. So what's up? Maybe it's the same case as the anaphores. Maybe they have to, maybe our principle B talks about a binding domain. Is there a difference between principle A, sorry, uh, sentence A and sentence B? Yes, there is. In sentence A, the pronoun is in the same clause, which is the main clause, as the antecedent. In the second one, they're in different clauses. This is an embedded clause, and that is the bigger main clause. Mary, the antecedent, is in the main clause, and the pronoun is in the embedded clause. So they're not in the same clauses. Therefore, principle B, as it seems, also must take into consideration the binding domain. The binding domain here seems to be the same clause as the antecedent. So as long as this pronoun is in another clause, that means whatever antecedent we see in another clause does not count. 
That's why the sentence is still grammatical, because under this definition, within the same clause, there is no antecedent that can bind it. Therefore, it is free in the domain. So let's fix up our principle B. Principle B. Our principle B used to state that a pronoun must be free, and that was it. Now let's add that a pronoun must be free in its binding domain. So as long as we have a pronoun in an embedded clause, and there is no antecedent to be found within the clause, so even if you have an antecedent outside in another clause, this will not count as an antecedent, because we are looking at only inside the clause. So we ask, inside the clause, is it free? If yes, then we are still on the right track. Now what about principle C, the one that concerns our expressions? Generally speaking, principle C states that an R expression must be free. But let's see if the R expression or if principle C has to take the binding domain into consideration or not. Let's see, first of all, how we can violate our original principle C. We can do that if an R expression becomes bound. Our definition of principle C states that the R expression must always be free. So let's see some examples. We can easily say John hit him or himself, right? We can say John hit himself. But we can never say he hit John and have the same index. Because in this case, he and John are the same. So now since they have the same index, and he, C commands John, John as an R expression will be bound. And we know that it should be free. So then he must refer to someone else if we want this sentence to be grammatical. Let's change this to K, for example. Now he could refer to someone else like Bob. He hit John with different indexations is a grammatical sentence because John as an R expression remains free. But where the indexation was the same and therefore John is bound, the sentence is ungrammatical. Now how about binding domain? Is that of any importance? Let's see. He said that John danced. Now who is he? Intuitively we understand that he cannot be John. It could be Bob. It could be Peter. But it can't be John, right? Now why is that? If we do force it to be John, so we give it the same index, and we already know that he, C commands John, what is the result? Well, the result is that John is now bound, right? And if he is the same person as John, we find out that the sentence is ungrammatical. Intuitively, we know that it should be ungrammatical because when we first asked what does he refer to, we thought that he was for sure some other guy. The reason why this happens in the first place is because we know that the other alternative, where he is the same person as John, will yield an ungrammatical sentence. And that's why we don't even think about that. Now notice here that John is in an embedded clause. This antecedent is in the main clause, but still the sentence is ungrammatical. What this means is that an R expression must be free, let's add something here, everywhere. An R expression must be free everywhere. So to sum up, principle A suggests that an anaphore must be bound in its binding domain, which is the same clause as its antecedent. Principle B suggests that pronouns must be free in their binding domain, which is the one where the antecedent is located. So the same binding domain is the same as that for the anaphore. The R expression must be free everywhere. So regardless, an R expression must be free in the same clause as its antecedent or in another clause. In all these cases, it must remain free. So that's that when it comes to binding theory. What we've explained so far will be enough for the purposes of this course. We talked about the three types of nouns. We talked about 
anaphors, we talked about pronouns, we talked about our expressions. We said that anaphors abide by principle A of the binding theory, pronouns abide by principle B, and our expressions by principle C. We also talked about co-indexation, talked about C command, talked about what binding means, and we talked about the binding domain. That's all for binding theory. See you in our next lecture.